Order, order. Question the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. I call Secretary Matt Hancock to answer substantive question number one from Jason McCartney. Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and with your permission, I'll answer questions one to nine together. I'm proud that the NHS began vaccinating patients against COVID-19 on the 8th of December at the start of the biggest immunisation programme in British history. I'm delighted to tell the House that over 2.3 million people in the UK have now received the first dose of their COVID-19 vaccine, and over the coming weeks and months, the rate of vaccination will increase as more doses become available and the vaccination programme continues to expand. Let's head over to Combe Valley with Jason McCartney. Jason McCartney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thousands of elderly and vulnerable people have already been vaccinated across Kirklees, but some of my constituents are rightly worried that they may have to travel to other parts of the country to a large vaccination centre to get their jabs. Can the Secretary of State please confirm that all of my constituents will be able to get their jabs locally? And when will the new vaccination centre at Huddersfield's John Smith Stadium be opening? Well, yes, everybody will be able to get a jab locally. Uh, we're committed to ensure that across England, there'll be a local vaccination centre available within 10 miles of where everyone lives. For the large, vast majority of people, over 95% of people, this will be a, uh, a fixed permanent site uh, for some of the most rural parts, more rural than my honourable friend's constituency, uh, that some of these will be uh, mobile units. Uh, but if people get called to a vaccination centre, a mass vaccination centre, and they feel it is too far for them to travel, then they will be able to get a vaccine locally by one of the local uh, GP services. Um, and specifically on the John Smith Stadium in Huddersfield, I'm really delighted that this is going to be opening in the next couple of weeks. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I very much welcome the great work by my colleagues in government in securing the vaccine supplies for all parts of the United Kingdom and the amazing work of the NHS staff in ensuring that these vaccines have been delivered into people's arms as quickly as possible. But can the Minister um, tell the House how many vaccines have been delivered by the UK Government for use in Scotland? Well, we distribute the vaccine supplies that are available according to population, so based on the Barnet formula. And then in Scotland, of course, it's the Scottish NHS uh, that is delivering. So a fair population share of uh, vaccine is available to the Scottish NHS, and that's available right now. They have the, uh, the stocks to be able to do that. And then, of course, it's for the, uh, the NHS in Scotland uh, to do the vital work of making sure that each and every one of those jabs gets into somebody's arm and helps to protect lives. Let's head up to Yorkshire with Julian Sturdy. Julian Sturdy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The vaccination programme in York is making encouraging progress with the first doses of the Oxford vaccine arriving last week and Askenbar and Haxby centres delivering injections in line with the priority list, which is fantastic news. However, can the Secretary of State reassure me that every care is being taken to ensure that smaller GP practices in rural areas are in no way disadvantaged in scheduling their patients for vaccination relative to the more larger urban practices? Of course, small or large, rural or urban, we need people uh, to, uh, we need GPs to be vaccinating right across the country. And that, that's what's happening. We're organising this through uh, what are called primary care networks, which are groups of GPs that cover between 30,000 and 50,000 patients. And the reason to do that is so that e each of a group of GP practices can contribute some staff to the vaccination team so that they can carry on with the other vital work that they're doing. So these networks are, of course, larger in more sparsely populated parts of the country like North Yorkshire, uh, but nevertheless, that's why we've put in place this commitment to everybody having a vaccination centre within uh, 10 miles of where they live to make sure that we do reach all parts. David Morgan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There is welcome news that St James's Hospital in my constituency is to become a vaccination centre and constituents are eager to see it up and running. Will the Secretary of State confirm when the hardworking staff and volunteers on the ground will receive the doses and equipment they need to open the centre? 
Yes, I'm, I'm really delighted um, to, uh, uh, to hear that, that um, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to highlight that news. Uh, and I, I'm also really glad, uh, Mr Speaker, that as this, uh, the Honourable Gentleman has just demonstrated, this is a national effort that we can all play our part in, uh, and it's uh, the support across party that we've received for the vaccination effort uh, and that the NHS has received is incredibly welcome, and I know that the NHS team on the ground will really appreciate the Honourable Gentleman's uh, support. Um, uh, the, the kit is, uh, it, it will be delivered uh, on time. Um, over 98% of vaccines have been uh, delivered on time. Of course, there's uh, always, in a very large logistical exercise, the occasional hiccup, uh, but I'll get back to him and I'll make sure that the Minister for Vaccine Deployment get back to him, gets back to him with the precise details uh, of, uh, of when the kit will arrive at his local hospital. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's fantastic news that 2.3 million people have already received the first dose of this vaccine across, uh, across the whole of the UK. Now, businesses and venues uh, across Milton Keynes are queuing up to, uh, to offer their support for, uh, for the vaccination programme, including the, uh, the wonderful ECG training, where I went for a COVID test last week. I passed, by the way, Mr Speaker. Um, can, uh, can the Secretary of State tell us what the plan is for accepting these kind offers of, uh, of help and support with the vaccination programme? Well, I'm really delighted that ECG training are involved in hosting uh, some of the testing centres. And, of course, we've had uh, amazing offers of support that are now being used uh, as testing centres and as the over 1,000 vaccination centres uh, that we have uh, across the country. We've been working with some sites since the summer to, to be ready uh, to be vaccination centres. Uh, and we're, we're always uh, open to further uh, offers of support. Um, and, um, but I, I, would, I, I would say that we have been working on this for, uh, for some time. Uh, it's also important, of course, that for infection control reasons, when we have testing centres and vaccine sites, um, if they are put in the same place, then they're kept uh, separate, not least because of you know, we want to make sure that when an octogenarian goes for a vaccine, then, they're, then they are, of course, uh, kept safe in the process of, uh, of getting the vaccine. Uh, the thing to do uh, is to raise this specific offer of support with my honourable friend, the Minister for Vaccine Deployment. Let's head to Scunthorpe with Holly Mumbycroft. Holly Mumbycroft. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank my right honourable friend for his help in getting the vaccine into our Ironstone Centre, Scunthorpe Hospital, and I'm really pleased to say some of our care homes too now. Can he tell us how the new Oxford vaccine will speed up access to the jab for those still waiting and what that means for towns and villages in my area, such as Hibblestow, Scorby, Curtin Lindsay and Messingham? Will they see more local vaccination centres? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. For the, it is so important to get the vaccine to care homes, uh, and over a quarter of care home residents have now been received their first dose of uh, the vaccine. And the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is, of course, much easier to get to care homes. We will be seeing, we'll be doing that by taking the vaccine to the care home. Uh, rather than opening uh, new centres. But I want people in Hibblestow and Scorby and uh, Curtin Lindsay and Messingham and throughout the uh, Scunthorpe constituency to know that they will be within 10 uh, miles of a vaccination centre uh, because we know how important it is that everybody can access this vaccine. Let's head to Brigham Gould with Andrew Percy. Andrew Percy. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I also thank the five GP vaccination centres serving my constituency in Brig Ghoul, Ouston Ferry, Scunthorpe and Barton? Uh, they're doing a cracking job at getting this vaccine out. As we move from phase one into phase two, though, uh, and the JCV, JCVI uh, advise that the, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to start looking at particular occupations, can I ask the Secretary of State to bear shop workers in mind who have had to work throughout this pandemic, including at the beginning, without any protection and, and who deal with hundreds of people every day. Can we make sure that they are prioritised as we move from phase one into phase two? Yes, I want to thank shop workers in essential shops who've got to, uh, got to be there for all of us. Uh, so even in these difficult times when the, when the virus um, is widely spread, uh, and we'll be looking very carefully at those professions that will need to be prioritised in phase two of the prioritisation 
uh, programme. Uh, it, it, we'll look at, of course, uh, teachers and, uh, and, and police uh, and others, but also we will look at uh, shop workers and we'll make those decisions based on the data. Rob uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I end uh, the work that my uh, honourable friend is doing in terms of the vaccine rollout? Across West Yorkshire, we have four large scale vaccination centres planned, but this means in the Bradford district that we've got one. Can I put in a plea? Uh, to have a large-scale vaccination centre in Keighley, but also consider where smaller uh, scale uh, offerings are coming forward, like Ilkley Rugby Club, that they could also be considered as vaccination centres. We'll absolutely look at those, uh, those two suggestions, but I would just also remind my honourable friend and all of his constituents and all those across the Bradford district that, yes, there are the large-scale vaccination centres, but there's also the primary care-based uh, uh, delivery, uh, which is happening uh, right across the country. Well, I said to Twickenham with Manera Wilson. Manera Wilson. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's been reported that Pinnacle, the IT system being used to organise the vaccinations, is already struggling to cope with heavy usage. My local GP vaccination hub, which I visited on Friday, reported it was being slow, and there have also been worrying reports about very elderly people having to queue for a long time outdoors while staff try to get the IT system working. Could the Secretary of State confirm then, please, what action the department's taking to ensure that the systems work more efficiently and will be able to cope as the number of, I uh, number of vaccination sites grow? Clearly, the IT underpinnings of this uh, project are, are critical. Uh, the Pinnacle system is working well, uh, but we're constantly, constantly monitoring it to make sure that it supports uh, the rollout of the vaccine. Shall the Secretary of State ask me? Yeah. 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 Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Of course, our encouragement at the rollout of the vaccine is of course our sense of encouragement is of course tempered by our deep alarm at the situation we are in over 80,000 people have died on current trends we are likely to see more deaths in this wave than we saw in the first wave millions still have to go to work and this virus is now more infectious those still going to work are of course NHS staff the BMA say 46,000 of them are off sick with COVID can he go further and faster and ensure that NHS staff, frontline staff, receive the vaccination in the next two weeks? And can he provide daily updates on the numbers of NHS staff who have been vaccinated? Yeah. Well, we do now provide the daily statistics on the rollout of the vaccine, and we'll provide more uh, data uh, as the system uh, matures and as the, as the rollout uh, advances. Uh, the, he's absolutely right, Mr Speaker, to raise... The, the, the challenges that the NHS is facing uh, today. And it's very important that whilst the rollout of the vaccine is proceeding uh, well and we're on track to hit the targets that we have set, um, we must also stress to everybody the importance of following the rules which are in place in order to control this virus uh, and reduce the pressures on the NHS which are uh, it, which are very considerable at this moment. We all understand that until vaccination is rolled out more generally, we will continue to see hospitalisations. And the NHS is currently in a crisis. Beds are filling up. ICU surge capacity is being maxed out. Ambulances are backed up outside hospitals. And there are warnings about oxygen supplies as well. I mean, hospitals were not built for these demands on oxygen. So can he assure us that there are contingencies in place, and can he guarantee that no hospital will run out of oxygen in the coming weeks? Yeah. Well, well um, Mr Speaker, there are these very significant pressures on the NHS. When it comes to the specific question about oxygen supplies, um, the limitation is not the supply of oxygen itself. It is the ability to get the oxygen through systems uh, through the physical oxygen supply systems within hospitals. And that essentially becomes a constraint on an individual hospital's ability uh, to take more COVID patients, because obviously the supply of oxygen is central to the treatment of, uh, of people with COVID in hospital. And because we have a national uh, health service, 
Um, if a hospital uh, can't uh, put more pressure on its oxygen system, then people go to a different hospital and we take people to a different hospital. So I can assure him that there is no constraint um, that we are anywhere near on the national availability of oxygen, oxygenated beds. Uh, it does mean, as he knows and as we've seen uh, reported, uh, that sometimes we have to move patients to a different part of the, um, as local as possible, but occasionally across the country, to make sure that they get the treatment that they need. Let's head up to Scotland with SNP spokesperson Dr Philip Whitford. Dr Whitford. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, the Secretary of State revealed that only a quarter of care home residents in England have been vaccinated against COVID, despite being the number one priority group. Can he explain why they were not the first cohort to receive the Pfizer vaccine in December, as was the case in Scotland? Um, uh, that's not quite right, uh, Mr Speaker. I'm glad to report that uh, care home residents uh, have been receiving the Pfizer jab. Uh, it, is, it is harder and logistically more difficult, uh, and I'm delighted that if you look at the total uh, rollout of the, uh, of the programme, as she says, over a quarter of people now uh, who are residents in care homes are uh, able to get the jab, and that number is rising sharply. Turning to Dr Whitford. Dr Whitford. Dr Whitford's second question has disappeared. We'll move on. Navandu Mishra, we've got a substantive question. Who's answering? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I'm sure, firstly, that the whole House will want to join me in sending our best wishes to the Right Honourable Member for Old Bexley and Sidcup and his family for his treatment, and we look forward to seeing him back in this place in due course. Yeah, 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 yeah. The NHS has been clear since the beginning of the pandemic that the continuation of urgent cancer treatment must be a priority. Latest data showed urgent cancer referrals continuing to increase with nearly 88% of all patients seeing a specialist within two weeks of referral and nearly 96% of patients receiving treatment within 31 days for a decision to treat. However, I must caveat that, that the context for this data was before the recent rise in coronavirus cases. The NHS is open. It is hugely important that any person worried about any symptom comes forward and knows that care is there. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to associate myself with the comments regarding the member for honourable member for uh, Old Bexley, and I wish him a speedy, speedy recovery. I also want to thank the hardworking colleagues in the NHS that are doing everything they can to ensure that cancer care and treatment can continue. However, unfortunately, due to the unprecedented demand on ICU capacity caused by the pandemic, an increasing number of urgent priority two cancer surgeries have been cancelled. Can the minister assure me that everything is being done uh, to work with the Treasury to increase capacity available to the NHS by continuing to commission the independent sector to ensure that urgent care and treatment can continue so that cancer doesn't become the forgotten sea in this crisis? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, I can unreservedly say yes to that. I would like to also say that um, what has happened, the NHS is under huge pressure, and there have been some instances where unavoidable, for uh, totally understandable, unavoidable reasons, such as staff ICU capacity or the safety of patients themselves, treatment has been rescheduled. Um, any such decisions are always made as a last resort, but we have changed the way we operate. Um, making sure that we've got COVID secure cancer hubs, consolidated surgery, centralised triage to prioritise those patients whose need is most urgent. And we have utilised the independent sector and will continue to do so to increase capacity. These measures and the tremendous efforts, as the Honourable Member said, of our NHS cancer workforce and their teams is helping ensure that those who need treatment can continue without delay. Minister Alex Norris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, throughout the pandemic, we have been calling for a cancer recovery plan, so we were glad to see one published in December, but disappointed that it only ran for a couple of months. 
Events have clearly overtaken us since that publication, and the unprecedented demand on our NHS risk further delays to treatment and to people entering the system for treatment. These plans must now go much, much further. Will the Minister make a commitment today to work with the sector and interested parliamentarians to develop the recovery plan into one that properly addresses the backlog and builds improved treatment pathways for the future? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank um, the honourable gentleman. We worked on the Cancer Services Recovery Plan was worked on by both clinicians, um, stakeholders, including the charities, to make sure that we had a robust plan for addressing um, the challenges that have come about throughout the pandemic. The levels remain high um, uh, into referral and treatment, despite other pressures on the NHS, but I would like to assure him I meet regularly with both Callie pa Palmer and with Professor Peter Johnson, who lead for the NHS in this area, and we have left, made it absolutely clear that since the beginning of the pandemic, the continuation of urgent cancer treatment is a priority, as is the restoration, and then making sure that we can do what we can to ensure that swift treatment is there for everybody. And I meet regularly with APPGs, indeed I'm meeting with one uh, Thursday of this week, so I can assure him on that front. Going back to Scotland, to Dr Whitford, with the Secretary of State to answer the second question. Dr Whitford. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. As the Secretary of State highlighted earlier, primary care networks will play a major role in rolling out the vaccine in England. But we've heard previously from MPs that not all areas are covered by such networks. So how does he plan to avoid a postcode lottery and ensure equitable access, and particularly outreach into vulnerable ethnic or deprived communities? Um, Mr Speaker, 99% uh, of GP surgeries are members of primary care networks. Uh, the very, very small minority that aren't uh, are, being, um, are, are, are being dealt with to, to ensure uh, that we have the fair access to uh, vaccines, as she says, and of course they'll be covered by invitations to the large vaccination sites as well. Um, in addition, in the second part of the question, I agree very strongly with her that it's vital that we reach into and support those communities uh, who, are, who may be um, more uh, distant uh, and harder to reach, um, both geographically and in some cases culturally. The, the NHS is very well placed to do that and is one of the most trusted public services in support of uh, encouraging all those from all backgrounds to take the jab, uh, and pharmacists too will play a vital role in this outreach programme. Substances question to Minister number 60. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Community asymptomatic testing... Ah, with your permission, Mr Speaker, please may I group questions 16, 17 and 18. Um, community asymptomatic testing is an important tool in the fight against COVID-19. We have delivered over 5 million lateral flow tests to the 117 local authorities that have already gone live with testing their communities, and we are rapidly expanding the programme to all remaining local authorities in England, as well as working with devolved administrations on their plans. Let's head up to Rother Valley with Alexander Stafford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 94-year-old Tom Drury-Smith from Todwick was the first to receive the vaccine in Rother Valley at the Anderson Medical Centre, thanks to the amazing work of the Rotherham CCG and the Primary Care Network. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that the key to both community testing and, vac and the vaccine uptake is to ensure people do not have to travel far to access centres, especially those who are older who do not have access to cars? And can she assure me and others that the vaccine centres and community testing centres will be cited as appropriately as possible, including Rother Valley areas such as Swallownest and Maltby? I thank my honourable friend for the question, and it's absolutely great to hear about the work of Rotherham CCG and my honourable friend's primary care network, who are clearly on the front foot in this vital work of vaccinating people at high risk in his community. And absolutely, and as you may have heard from the Secretary of State earlier, we are making sure that everybody is able to access a community testing as they need it, but also a vaccination centre within reach. Let's head to Derbyshire with Heather Wheeler. Heather Wheeler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, would the Minister join me in welcoming the opening of community testing centres around Swaddlingcote in recent weeks? 
paving the way for greater testing capability and coverage uh, right the way across Derbyshire. Uh, could the minister also confirm that the rapid lateral flow tests being used are indeed accurate and reliable and are an important tool in tackling asymptomatic transmission of the COVID virus? Well, I absolutely join my honourable friend in welcoming the opening of community testing centres in Swaddlingcote. Asymptomatic testing enables us to pick up cases in high prevalence areas that otherwise would go undetected. So this means we can break chains of transmission. There has been extensive clinical evaluation from Public Health England and Oxford University that shows that lateral flow tests are appropriate for this use. They identify over two-thirds of all people who have COVID-19 but often don't have symptoms, and importantly, they catch the vast majority with a high viral load. I said to Lincoln with Carl McCartney. Carl McCartney. Good morning, Speaker, and thank you. What specifically can be done to assist school teachers in Lincoln and across the country? to have readily available rapid lateral flow antigen tests to enable them to carry on teaching and for schools to stay open and maybe for exams to be sat. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I can assure my honourable friend that most secondary schools and colleges have already set up testing sites and have begun weekly testing using lateral flow devices for staff who are currently in school. Staff can also participate in daily contact testing on site and primary schools will shortly be receiving test kits for weekly staff testing and also daily contact testing. Shadow Minister Justin Mathers. Thank you Mr Speaker. We can have all the testing in the world but it won't be effective if people don't self-isolate after a positive result. We have repeatedly said compliance with self-isolation rules is not good enough and we have only one in eight people qualifying for the self-isolation payment. That is not surprising. So can the Minister ensure that everyone is properly supported to self-isolate from now on? And can she also explain why those who test positive after a last lateral flow test cannot apply for a payment and do not even enter the National Test and Trace system? Uh, well, absolutely, we recognise not only the importance of self-isolation, which is critical in breaking the chains of transmission, but also that it is not always easy for people to do so. We recognise, for instance, the cost of self-isolation. That's why we introduced a payment of £500 for those who are on low incomes and unable to work from home while isolating. We will continue to make sure that people have the support that they need to self-isolate. Substantive question to Secretary Hancock. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. The Innova lateral flow tests for COVID-19 identify a substantial proportion of those who are shedding viral load due to their COVID-19. We, of course, identify, analyse and publish the evidential basis for the use of these tests, as with the other tests that are used in the National Testing Programme. Heading up to Scotland with Neil Hanvey. Neil Hanvey. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and uh, I would like to thank the Secretary of State for that answer. Um, uh, I, I would also like to thank him for his uh, uh, helpful response to my questions in the Select Committee last week. And in that spirit, um, he will know that I've been pursuing uh, the use of lateral flow tests since uh, early November when concerns were first raised. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, some of those concerns uh, continued to persist, and uh, not least uh, they were underscored by communication from his department as recently as the 11th of December, which stated, we are not currently planning mass asymptomatic testing. Swab testing people with no symptoms is not an accurate way of screening the general population as there is a risk of giving false reassurance. Widespread asymptomatic testing could undermine the value of testing as there are risk of, as a risk of giving misleading results. Given those ongoing concerns, uh, I would be most grateful if the Secretary of State would commit to a meeting uh, uh, to consider those concerns in a bit more detail. Order, order. I think the Secretary of State can take an answer off that. Uh, lateral flow tests are incredibly important to be able to find people who otherwise we wouldn't be able to find. One in three people, Mr Speaker, have this disease without knowing it, and finding those positive cases helps us to break the trains of transmission. Let's head up to Yorkshire with five bets. Five bets. Or oh, substantive question, First Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am pleased to report that the strong recent performance of the contact tracing service has been maintained even with a significant growth in cases. The latest weekly data show the service made contact with almost 700,000 people 
85% of positive cases were reached and provided details of their close contacts, and 92% of those close contacts, that's almost half a million people, were then reached and told to self-isolate. To Sheffield with Clive Betts. Clive Betts. Speaker, uh, I was asking the Director of Public Health in Sheffield the other day about the, the figures for contact uh, tracing. He says that in the NHS test and trace system, not the, the Public Health England one, the NHS one, the current figures are 59% then of the 40% not contacted, they're passed on down to the local level, um, to the City Council's contact tracing service, which is then contacting 75% of the people the national system couldn't contact. Why then doesn't the government give more resources and more responsibility to the local council, to the director of public health? In that way, we could contact more people at far less cost than the national system. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, the Honourable Member has described, in fact, what is a really important partnership working between the national NHS test and trace system and local partnership local authorities, as indeed is happening in his own area of Sheffield, where it's that combined working which enables us to contact the maximum number of people and therefore get more people to self-isolate and break these trains of transmission. Mitchell. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, care... Question 27, Alan. 22. Uh, care at the end of life is a crucial part of our health and care system, and we're committed to improving the quality of care for those at the end of life. Current practice is informed by a range of evidence, including guidelines issued by the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. The government is open to gathering data on terminally ill people's experience in order to inform the debate. Andrew Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, may I also express my gratitude to the NHS in all its many forms in the royal town of Sutton Coalfield for all their hard work over Christmas and the New Year, including giving me a new knee. Um, Mr. Speaker, can I thank the Secretary of State for managing to take an interest in this important subject when he is so stretched on so many other fronts? Can I say to him that nearly 10% of suicides are by people who are terminally ill? And the APPG, which I have the privilege of co-chairing, will hear from a mother this afternoon whose terminally ill son took his own life by throwing himself under an HGV on the North Circular. To add to knowledge, information and understanding, will he and his department make a point of working with coroners and the Office of National Statistics from across the country so that we can understand the true extent of these tragedies? Yes, of course. I'm very happy to look at the suggestion that the right honourable friend, my right honourable friend, makes on this very sensitive uh, subject. We want to see the highest possible standards of patient safety, and of course, reduce the number of suicides. Uh, and it is important in pursuing that uh, to have as much information and evidence as possible. We have a substantive question to Minister Zahawi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Across the United Kingdom, Mr. Speaker, we have over 2,700 vaccination sites up and running, with seven vaccination centres opening this week and more to come next week and the week after. Regarding Fielding Palmer Hospital that my honourable friend has raised, I can confirm, Mr. Speaker, that this site is now being actively considered as a vaccination hub. I said to South Leicestershire with Alberta Costa. Alberta. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Minister and his team for the help that they gave me and my team in cajoling, pushing, encouraging the CCG to reopen the Fielding Palmer Hospital in Lutterworth as a vaccination centre. This is excellent news for the people of Lutterworth and the surrounding villages. Will the Minister also confirm that the remaining parts of South Leicestershire, from Broughton Astley to Bronston, from Thorpe, Astley to Arnsby will also be able to access vaccination centres locally. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful to my honourable friend, not just uh, uh, for his support, uh, his, his um, characteristic support and encouragement, uh, but also for his you know, championing of his constituents. I can confirm, as the Secretary of State has said, that uh, all his constituents will be no more than 10 miles away um, from a vaccination centre. I'm pleased that the Sturdy Road Health and Wellbeing Centre, which is a little over 10 miles away from Lutterworth, are administering vaccines now. We 
We now have a substantive question from Bob Seeler to Minister Hancock. Right, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, uh, the Government's response to the pandemic has been informed by a considerable range of expert scientific and medical advice, uh, and we've seen an increasing understanding of coronavirus uh, globally. The UK has produced new scientific evidence throughout the pandemic, and when we take decisions, these are based on and guided by the best possible uh, science, but of course policy decisions are for Ministers. Let's head to the Isle of Wight with Bob Seeley. Bob Seeley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Secretary of State. Regarding the stats and science on the island, our vaccine hub at the Riverside Centre is expected to be ready on the 15th of July. We may not receive sign-off and vaccines for that centre until the 25th of July or later. With our rise in infection on the island, our demographic profile and our isolation, I'm concerned we're not high enough on the vaccine supply list, despite the great work being done by the Isle of Wight Hampshire team. I've written to the Secretary of State and the Vaccine Minister about this. What can be done uh, to improve the situation and what reassurance can you give to me and folks on the Isle of Wight? Thank you. Uh, Mr Speaker, we will absolutely have vaccines being delivered on the Isle of Wight before the 15th of July. Indeed, we'll have them done there before the 15th of February. And we're committed to offering a vaccine to all those in the four highest priority cohorts, which includes all over 70s. And there's a lot of over 70s on the Isle of Wight. Uh, furthermore, uh, we will make sure uh, that we have vaccination centres within 10 miles of where everyone uh, lives. There are vaccines, vaccinations happening on the Isle of Wight right now. Uh, my honourable friend is a great champion of the island and will make sure uh, that that delivery continues to pace. Substantive question to Minister Zahawi. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, the vaccines are without a doubt the biggest breakthrough since the pandemic began, a huge step forward in our fight against coronavirus and testament to the Secretary of State's absolute laser-like focus on vaccines. We are here today uh, with 2.4 million uh, doses administered and rising. However, uh, Mr Speaker, the full impact of COVID-19 vaccinations on infection rates will not be clear until a larger uh, number of people have been uh, vaccinated. I said to Wickham with Steve Baker. Steve Baker. Mr Speaker, I'm very pleased to welcome the announcement of a vaccination site at Adams Park in Wickham and further sites to be announced shortly. Uh, my honourable friend has told us that uh, when the top four JVCI uh, groups have been vaccinated, that will account for 88% of fatalities. So can he not very soon give people a hope which is sure and not too distant that their freedoms will be returned as this vaccination programme rolls forward? Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I'm very grateful for my honourable friend's uh, continued support, and not least on making sure that he examines the data very carefully. I know it's something that he's passionate about. He's absolutely right that when we uh, offer the vaccine to those top four most vulnerable cohorts in the list of nine from JC5, 88% of mortality effectively comes from those four cohorts, 99% of mortality from the top nine most vulnerable uh, cohorts. At a, a point in time, that point of inflection between community spread and, of course, vaccination, and as I will quote the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, uh, Jonathan Van Tam, when he said, ask me in a uh, you know, few weeks, few months' time if it does uh, obviously impact on spread. Uh, the scientists are hopeful, as are we, as is the Prime Minister, not least because he wants to see the back of these uh, non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions in the economy. A substantive question to Minister Arger. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, and with your permission, sir, I'll group questions 27 and 28. COVID, and particularly the new strain of COVID, has had a significant impact on NHS bed capacity. As of the 10th of January, 30,758 beds across the NHS were occupied by COVID patients. Just in the past day, that has risen to now around 32,000. That's around over a third of all available beds. The latest bed occupancy data shows just shy of 80,000 out of the NHS's roughly 90,000 total general and acute beds were occupied. I said up to Acton with Dr. Hub. Dr. Rupert. 
It's great that the NHS, as I've heard locally, are working hard to stop intensive care beds running out after a decade of no expansion now that London's been declared a major incident. But can he guarantee that rather than just a bureaucratic exercise, taking a population based approach, listening to clinicians in a apportioning capacity and allowing high need mixed ethnicity areas their fair share, like Ealing Hospital currently on a black alert, rather than just always the powerful players of central London teaching hospitals getting all the extra allocation. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady. I can reassure her that uh, beds and increased capacity where we put that in place is allocated on the basis of where it is needed. And just briefly, in respect of her local hospital trust, London Northwest University Healthcare NHS Trust, she's right to highlight the pressure they are under. The team there, as across the NHS, are doing an amazing job. But at her trust, the critical care bed occupancy rate was 98.7% on the latest figures I've had. That is extremely significant in terms of pressure, but I can give her the reassurance that we look to ensure all areas um, receive the resources they need. I said up to Lewisham with Ellie Reeves. Ellie Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. London has declared a state of emergency and the stark reality is that at this rate we'll run out of beds for patients within the next couple of weeks. At least two NHS hospitals in the capital have already postponed urgent cancer surgery and figures show that treatment levels are failing to keep pace with demand. Will the Minister therefore commit to fully opening the London Nightingale Hospital secure the use of London's private hospitals for cancer treatment and invest in the number of beds in our NHS for the long term. Thank you, um, Mr Speaker. And the Honourable Lady is absolutely right to highlight the pressure that the NHS and critical care is under in London, but indeed more broadly than that. And I pay tribute to all those, again, who are working in that. Indeed, um, my shadow, um, who I suspect has been on the front line in recent days as well, and I pay tribute to her, Mr Speaker. The best way we can thank them is by following the advice to stay at home um, and to follow the rules. In respect of her specific point, yes, we are involving the independent sector capacity, Nightingale capacity and increasing NHS capacity, all of those alongside other measures to ensure that our NHS continues to be able to treat those who need this care at this time. Shadow Minister Dr Osana Alan Khan. Last night, I finished, finished a shift in a busy East London hospital sharing difficult news with hopeful families. The resilience of staff on the front line is one that can never be matched, but across the country, morale is on a cliff edge. A decade of cuts to beds, services and staff, combined with pay freezes, have left NHS workers undermined and undervalued. Without our incredible staff, a hospital bed is simply just that, a bed. So does the Health Minister regret how the government have made frontline workers feel? And can he promise to change this? Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Well, I would reiterate, as I did earlier, my thanks to her and indeed all of her colleagues in the NHS for everything they're doing. And I would reassure her, as I do and as my right honourable friend does, at every opportunity, just how valued and supported our NHS are. We have uh, put in place I think, just over a thousand additional critical care bed capacity at this time. The right thing to do. And in addition, um, in respect of supporting staff, we are investing um, around £15 million, pounds, just one example, £15 million pounds in support around mental health hubs and mental health support for staff who I saw from the hospital she works in, in her constituency or has worked in, a number of staff on the BBC recently setting out just how flat out they are. The best way we can thank them alongside what we're doing, as I say, and I make no apologies for reiterating it, Mr Speaker, is that we all need to follow the rules to stay at home to help ease the pressure on those phenomenally hard-working and valued staff in our NHS hospitals. We now come to topic of question to the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. I call Secretary Matt Hancock to make a statement on his responsibilities. Then I will call Rachel Maskell to ask her supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, yesterday we launched our UK Vaccines Delivery Plan, which sets out how we will vaccinate hundreds of thousands of people every day, starting with the most vulnerable and staff in NHS and social care. I am delighted that across the UK, 2.3 million people have already been vaccinated, 
and we're on track to deliver our commitment to offer a first dose to everyone in the most vulnerable groups by the 15th of February. At the same time, Mr Speaker, may I add my voice to all those who are passing on their very best wishes uh, to my right hon. Friend, the member for Bexley and all Sidcup, uh, who is uh, undergoing further uh, treatment on the NHS, and thank personally all of those in the NHS who are looking after him and all of the other patients who are in their care. Let's head up to York with Rachel Baskell. Rachel Baskell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The NHS is overwhelmed and critical clinical choices are having to be made due to the limitations of estate and of staffing. So I asked the Secretary of State if he will do two things. One, bring all independent hospitals under the NHS to provide response to the national crisis and in particular provide cancer care capacity. And secondly, call all former health professionals to return to practice and re-register, even if they are beyond the three years out of practice limit, so they can work with an element of supervision so no one is denied the clinical need that they have. Well, Mr Speaker, of course all these things are being looked at and the pressures on the NHS are very significant. I, I'd also want to say, though, to people who have a healthcare condition that is not COVID-related that they should come forward to the NHS because that promise that the NHS has of always treating people according to their clinical need, not ability to pay, that, that promise is crucial and it's just as crucial in these pressured times as it is at any other time. So if you find a lump or a bump, if you have a, uh, a, a, a problem uh, with your heart, if there is a condition that you need to come forward for, urgent treatment for, then the NHS is open and you must help us to help you. So yes, we absolutely will do everything we possibly can to address the pressures, including the measures, looking at the measures that the Honourable Lady set out, but also let the message go out that if you need the NHS for other conditions, then please do come forward. Let's head to the Chair of the Select Committee, Jeremy Hunt. Jeremy Hunt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I congratulate my right honourable friend on the speed of the vaccine rollout and in particular his foresight in setting up the vaccines task force as far back as last April, which has made it possible. And a personal thanks from my mum, who is getting her vaccine tomorrow at Epsom Racecourse. However, understandably, public expectations as to how quickly they're going to get their vaccine are now running well ahead of the system's ability to deliver in particular causing floods of calls to GP surgeries who are already very busy. So what can we do to set expectations amongst the public that getting to population level immunity will be a marathon and not a sprint? Well, that's right, uh, Mr Speaker. The chair of the select committee is, is wise to say that this will be a, a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, we have now, as of uh, uh, early, the early hours of this morning, uh, vaccinated 39.9% of the over 80-year-olds in England, um, and we will reach all over 80-year-olds and ensure that they have the offer of a vaccine uh, over the coming weeks, and we'll reach all of the top, priority, top four priority groups uh, by the 15th of February. Uh, we're on track, and I'm confident that we'll deliver that. Uh, but the other message that, it, that maybe he will help uh, all of us to pass on to his constituents, including his mum, is that the NHS will get in contact with you and offer you an appointment. Uh, and that is the best and fairest way that we can get this rollout happening. Shadow Minister Liz Kendall. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State will know we can't protect the NHS unless we also protect social care. Yet there are worrying signs the government risks losing control of the virus here too. Infection rates in care homes have tripled in a month. Homes are reporting staff absence of up to 40%. And the latest weekly care home deaths are the highest since May. So can the Secretary of State set out what immediate extra support he will provide so the sector can cope? And will he commit to publishing daily vaccination rates for care home residents and staff so we know if the government is on track to completing them all in less than three weeks' time? Well, we have made that commitment, and it's incredibly important that vaccinations are offered to everybody in, uh, in care homes. 
uh, and the NHS is working very hard to deliver on that with our colleagues, uh, with their colleagues in social care, colleagues across the board working very hard to deliver this life-saving vaccine. Um, of course, we're always open to further support for social care, uh, and it's something that we're working on right now to ensure that we can get the right, the right support for testing, and in particular, to support the workforce uh, who are absolutely central to making this happen. Let's head up to Stoke-on-Trent North with Jonathan Gullis. Jonathan Gullis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And in Stoke-on-Trent North, Kidsgrove and Talk, we are ex excited to be the planned home of a mass vaccination centre. Stoke-on-Trent City Council is working around the clock, as it has done throughout this pandemic, to ensure everything is ready from their end. So can my right honourable friend give his assurances that the necessary equipment and staff will be ready to go the 25th of January, so we can get more jabs into arms. Yes, I'm delighted that there's going to be a mass vaccination centre. I can give that assurance uh, that we're working as hard as we possibly can to ensure that all the equipment's there, because ev everybody thinks about the vaccine, Mr Speaker, that's very important, but it's also about all the other things that are needed. For instance, the, the specialist syringes. This vaccine is so valuable that inside the syringe, there is a plunger that goes up into the needle to squeeze the extra bit of liquid that would otherwise be left in the needle into somebody's arm to make sure every last drop of vaccine is used. And so there's a whole series of other equipment that you need alongside the actual uh, 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 liquid of the, of the vaccine. Uh, and um, I will ensure that my honourable friend, the Vaccines Deployment uh, Minister, makes sure that the Stoke-on-Trent Mass Vaccination Centre is up and running and ready for the 25th of, of uh, January. I said to stop to North with Alex Cunningham. Alex Cunningham. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The COVID-19 pandemic has further served to expose and widen the tremendous health inequalities in Stockton, where life expectancy, healthy life expectancy, is amongst the lowest in the country. The borough also has by far the highest number of COVID cases on Teesside, now well in excess of 10,000. So, Secretary of State, when can we have a new hospital for Stockton to help tackle inequalities? Uh, well, uh, Mr Speaker, the importance of tackling health inequalities and levelling up parts of the country uh, that, uh, that, that have so much opportunity, uh, like Stockton, but need further support to unleash that opportunity, uh, that, is, uh, that is an incredibly important part of this agenda. And on his precise question, it's an issue that we have discussed before. As he knows, we have the largest hospital building programme in the, in the modern history of this country. Uh, and I look forward to continuing discussing with him uh, the, uh, the extra uh, infrastructure that's needed in Stockton. Let's head up to Calder Valley with Craig Whitaker. Craig Whitaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, can I congratulate my honourable friend and the whole ministerial team for an excellent start to the vaccination programme. But um, my question is on schools, and I know the government worked hard to keep schools open for as long as it possibly could. But unfortunately, under alert level five, they've sadly had to close. Can my right honourable friend outline what costs schools are expected to cover, whether they're state schools or public schools, to roll out the coronavirus testing in their schools once they reopen? Uh, well, there is extra funding available through the NHS Test and Trace uh, budget uh, for state schools for the testing programme, and we're working with independent schools uh, to make sure that they can reopen safely uh, when we're able, uh, as, soon as, as soon as safely possible, and to reopen schools across the country. Let's head up to Luton South with Rachel Hopkins. Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Secretary of State set out what additional measures are being put in place to support areas with diverse communities, such as Luton, where English not being a person's first language can be a barrier to ensuring equitable rollout of vaccination across all our communities? Yes, Mr Speaker. I, I answered a similar question from the SNP uh, spokeslady, and... This is an incredibly important point. Um, we are working very hard on it with, with councils, with pharmacists, with GPs, with those who are trusted in the community to get the message of the importance of vaccination out to all communities across, across the country. 
Uh, it's, an er it's a subject that's going to be increasingly important, and I look forward to working with her, uh, with obviously the, my colleague, the Minister for the Vaccines Rollout, and with colleagues all across this House to get the message of, of, of positivity uh, around the vaccine out. I would say, Mr Speaker, the good news is that over the last month, We've seen that the proportion of people who are enthusiastic about taking the vaccine has risen significantly, and the proportion of people who are hesitant has fallen. And I think people can see the enthusiasm that others have in taking the vaccine, but we've got to make sure that that message of hope reaches all parts and all communities in the UK. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In Burnley and Paddington, we have a large number of people who can't work from home working in areas like manufacturing and construction. The deployment of the Army going to our largest employers to do mass testing has been really welcome, but we have to go further if we're to break that chain of transmission. So could my round of friends set out what my constituents need to do if they have to keep going into work but need access to some of these tests? Yes, I hope that by working through uh, both Burnley Council uh, and, uh, and Lancashire uh, and working with the National Testing Programme, uh, we can get asymptomatic testing available in those, uh, for, the, for those who have to go uh, to work uh, because you know, key workers do need to go to work uh, even uh, the, through this most difficult of times. Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, make sure that the testing uh, minister uh, picks up with him straight after this and that we work together to make sure everybody across Burnley who does have to go to work uh, has access, if they want it, to a testing uh, regime to help ensure that they can be safe in work. Let's head to Upper Bound with Carla Lockhart. Carla Lockhart. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State will know the unprecedented physical and emotional strain our frontline nurses and medics are facing in the fight against COVID-19. This is exacerbated by staff shortages with increasing demand for care falling on our already worn out staff. Would the Health Secretary agree with me that to encourage more people into nursing and to retain our healthcare heroes in the NHS, we must look at increasing pay, to a level that recognises the skills, responsibility and commitment that nursing and healthcare professions require? Well, Mr Speaker, I'm really pleased that over the last uh, few years uh, in, uh, in the English health service that I'm responsible for, we have increased uh, the pay of nursing staff and I'm very pleased that when the new Northern Ireland administration uh, was uh, set up, uh, in, uh, about a year ago, one of the first things they did was resolve the challenges uh, in terms of nurses' pay. This is a very important subject. Uh, it is one that is uh, devolved, uh, but I look forward to working with my, uh, my counterpart in Northern Ireland, Robin Swan, who is doing a brilliant job in supporting the province through these very difficult times. Well, let's head to Yorkshire with Andrea Jenkins. Andrea Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I've been contacted by a number of my constituents from Morley and Atwood who have concerns on vaccine distribution. They're all vulnerable, some are shielding, have no cars and have difficulty using public transport to get their vaccine. And there's also concerns how some local GP surgeries are only vaccinating people over 80 with the surnames A to H. What is the department's plan to facilitate local distribution, especially in places that do not have good transport links and to increase rollout to other groups? Well, amongst the over 80s, we haven't put in place a more specific uh, prioritisation because we need to make sure that, uh, that, the, that the programme can get to all over 80s as fast as possible and as efficiently as possible. Access is incredibly important, hence the commitment to make sure that there's a vaccination centre within 10 miles. That is true, I think, to say across the whole of Morley and outward, um, Outlook. The, there is 96% of the population of England is now, is now within 10 miles of a vaccination centre, including, I think I'm right to say, the whole of her uh, constituency. But this has to be done fast, but it also has to be done fairly, and she's quite right to, re right to raise that point. I'm going to take the final question from Chiamara in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. Chiamara. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as a proud Unison member, I ask the Secretary of State to join me in congratulating Christina McInnie, elected the first female leader of the country's biggest union. Many of Unison's members effectively work for the Secretary of State, care assistants, hospital porters, nurses, cleaners, all now under huge stress, facing mental and physical challenges we fortunately cannot imagine. Does he agree with another recently elected leader, Joe Biden, who said of health workers, it's not enough to praise you, we have to protect you, we have to pay you. I want to add my congratulations to Christina McInnie and I, I want to uh, say uh, that I think that it is a, another sign of uh, progress in this country to see the first uh, female leader of Unison and I look forward very much to, uh, to talking to her very soon uh, and to working with her as she does represent, as she say, a significant number of people uh, who work for the NHS and are valued members of the NHS and social care uh, teams. Um, and um, the, the importance of not only valuing our NHS and social care workforce, uh, but of demonstrating that value is, is, is vital. Um, and improving all elements and all conditions uh, under which people work is important. Of course, pay is one part of that, and she'll know that the NHS was exempt from the pay freeze set out by the Chancellor. Um, but, at, but it's also about ensuring that everybody's contribution is valued and everybody is encouraged to give their very best contribution. And in a pandemic situation like this, when the pressures on the NHS and on social care are very great, that is more important than ever. But it's important all of the time that we value all of our team and everybody plays a part in improving the health of the nation and improving and saving lives. And I want to say a huge thank you to everybody who works in the NHS and in social care. And I want to work with them on improving working conditions, making sure that everybody feels that they can give their very, very best so that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady for raising this question, Mr Speaker. So we've had a poor day in getting through questions because they have taken far too long and a lot of people have missed out. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safe arrival of those participating in the next, I'm suspending the House for three minutes. Order.
Vi ordnar ju bra det. <laughs> okay. Order, I have a short statement to make about select committees. On Tuesday the 24th of March, the House passed an order allowing for virtual participation in select committee meetings and giving chairs associated powers to make reports. I was given the power under the order to extend it if necessary. I can notify the House today that I am now further extending the order until Friday the 30th of April. Right, I now call Secretary of State, Foreign Secretary in fact, Dominic Raab. Dominic Raab. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And with your permission, of course, I would like to update the House on the situation in Xinjiang and the Government's response. Mr Speaker, the evidence of the scale and the severity of the human rights violations being perpetrated in Xinjiang against the Uyghur Muslims is now far-reaching, and it paints a truly harrowing picture. Violations include the extrajudicial detention of over a million Uyghurs and other minorities in political re-education camps, extensive and invasive surveillance targeting minorities, systematic restrictions on Uyghur culture, education, and indeed the practice of Islam, and the widespread use of forced labour. The nature and conditions of detention violate basic standards of human rights and at their worst amount to torture and inhumane and degrading treatment, alongside widespread reports of the forced sterilisation of Uyghur uh, women. These claims are supported now by a large, diverse and growing body of evidence, and that includes first-hand reports from diplomats who visit Xinjiang, the first-hand testimony from victims who have fled the region, there is satellite imagery showing the scale of the internment camps, the presence of factories inside them, and the destruction of mosques. And there are also extensive and credible third-party reports from NGOs such as Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, with the UN and other international experts also expressing their very serious concerns. In reality, the Chinese authorities' own publicly available documents also bear out a very similar picture. They show statistical data on birth control and on security spending and recruitment in Xinjiang. They contain extensive references to coercive social measures dressed up as poverty alleviation programs. There are leaks of classified and internal documents that have shown the guidance on how to run internment camps, lists showing how and why people have been detained. Mr Speaker. Internment camps, arbitrary detention, political re-education, forced labour, torture and forced sterilisation, all on an industrial scale. It is truly horrific. Barbarism we had hoped lost to another era being practised today as we speak in one of the leading members of the international community. Mr Speaker, we have a moral duty to respond. The UK has already played a leading role within the international community in the effort to shine a light on the appalling treatment of the Uyghurs and to increase diplomatic pressure on China to stop and to remedy its actions. I have made my concerns over Xinjiang clear directly to China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi. We have led international joint statements on Xinjiang in the United Nations General Assembly, the Third Committee and the UN Human Rights Council. In the third committee, we brought the latest statement forward together with Germany in October of last year, and it was supported by 39 countries. Now, China's response, Mr. Speaker, is to deny as a matter of fact that any such human rights violations take place at all. They say it's lies. Mr. Speaker, if there were any genuine dispute about the evidence, there would be a reasonably straightforward way to clear up any factual misunderstandings. Of course, China should be given the opportunity to rebut to the various reports and claims. But the Chinese government refuses point blank to allow the access to Xinjiang required to verify the truth of the matter. We have repeatedly called for China to allow independent experts and UN officials, including the United Nations High Commissioner on Human Rights, proper access to Xinjiang. Just as we in this country would allow access to our prisons, to our police custody suites, other parts of the justice system, to independent bodies who will hold us to account for the commitments to respect human rights that we have made. Mr Speaker, China cannot simply refuse all access to those 
trusted third-party bodies who could verify the facts and at the same time maintain a position of credible denial. And while this access is not forthcoming, the UK will continue to support further research to understand the scale and the nature of the human rights violations in Xinjiang. But we must do more, and we will. Xinjiang's position in the international supply chain network means that there is a real risk of businesses and public bodies around the world, whether it's inadvertently or otherwise, sourcing from suppliers which are complicit in the use of forced labour. Allowing those responsible for those violations to profit or indeed making a profit themselves by supplying the authorities in Xinjiang. Mr Speaker, here in the UK we must take action to make sure that UK businesses are not part of the supply chains that lead to the gates of the internment camps in Xinjiang. And to make sure that the products of the human rights violations that take place in those camps don't end up on the shelves of supermarkets that we shop in here at home week in, week out. We've already engaged with businesses with links to Xinjiang. We've encouraged them to conduct appropriate due diligence. More widely, we've made our commitment to tackling forced labour crystal clear. And with the introduction of the Modern Slavery Act, the United Kingdom was the first country to require companies by law to report on how they're tackling forced labour in their supply chains. And today I can announce a range of new measures to send a clear message that these violations of human rights are un unacceptable and at the same time to safeguard UK businesses and public bod bodies from any involvement or links with them. I've been working closely with my right honourable friends, the Home Secretary, the Secretary of State for International Trade and the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. And our aim, put simply, is that no company that profits from forced labour in Xinjiang can do business in the UK and no UK business is involved in their supply chains. Let me set out the four new steps we are now taking. First, today the FCDO and DIT have issued new, robust and detailed guidance to UK businesses on the specific risks faced by companies with links to Xinjiang and underlining the challenges of conducting effective due diligence there. A minister-led campaign of business engagement will reinforce the need for UK businesses to take concerted action to address that particular and specific risk. Second, Mr Speaker, we are strengthening the operation of the Modern Slavery Act. The Home Office will introduce fines for businesses that do not comply with their transparency obligations. And the Home Secretary will introduce the necessary legislation, setting out the level of those fines as soon as parliamentary time allows. Third, we announced last September that the transparency requirements that apply to UK businesses under the Modern Slavery Act will be extended to the public sector. So the SCDO will now work with the Cabinet Office to provide guidance and support to UK government bodies to exclude suppliers where there is sufficient evidence of human rights violations in any of their supply chains. Let me say that we in the United Kingdom, I think rightly take pride that the overwhelming majority of British businesses that do business do so with great integrity and professionalism right around the world. That's their hallmark. It's part of our USP as a global Britain. It is precisely because of that, Mr Speaker, that any company profiting from forced labour will be barred from government procurement in this country. Fourth, Mr Speaker, the government will conduct an urgent review of export controls as they apply specifically geographically to the situation in Xinjiang to make sure that we are doing everything that we can to prevent the export of any goods that could directly or indirectly contribute to human rights violations in that region. This package put together will help make sure that no British organisations, government or private sector, deliberately or inadvertently, are profiting from or contributing to human rights violations against the Uyghurs or other minorities in Xinjiang. Of course, Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House would accept the overwhelming majority of British businesses wouldn't dream of it. Today's measures will make sure businesses are fully aware of those risks, it will help them to protect themselves, but it will also shine a light and penalise any reckless businesses that don't take those obligations seriously. As ever, we act in coordination with our like-minded partners around the world, and I 
welcome the fact that later today Foreign Minister Champagne will set out Canada's approach on these issues. I know Australia, the US, France, Germany and New Zealand are also uh, considering the approaches they take. We will continue to work with all of our international partners. But the House should know that in the comprehensive scope of the package I'm setting out today, the UK is again setting an example and leading the way. Mr Speaker, we want a positive and a constructive relationship with China. We will work tirelessly towards that end. But we won't sacrifice our values or our security. We will continue to speak up for what is right and we will back up our words with actions faithful to our values, determined as a truly global Britain to be an even stronger force for good in the world. And I commend this statement to the House. Shadow Foreign Secretary Lisa Nandy. The persecution of the Uyghur has been of great concern to honourable members on all sides of this House. We have read the reports, we have heard the testimony, it is past time to act. There must be a unified message from this whole House. We will not turn away, we will not permit this to go unchallenged. So can I thank the Foreign Secretary for advance sight of his statement, but say to him that the government had trailed long-awaited sanctions in the media on officials responsible for appalling human rights abuses in Xinjiang. We have waited months. He briefed the papers that he was planning to announce this today. What has happened to this announcement and who in government has overruled him this time? The strengths of his words are once again not matched by the strength of his actions, and I am sorry to say that that will be noticed loud and clear in Beijing. I was pleased to hear him acknowledge that the Modern Slavery Act is not working. The Independent Review was right to say that it has become a tick box exercise and we need a robust response to ensure companies are not just transparent but accountable. But there is little in today's statement that is new, and I am left slightly lost for words as to why the Foreign Secretary has chosen to come here today. It was back in September that the government said it would extend the Modern Slavery Act to the public sector. He mentioned France, which has already gone further than the UK with their duty of diligence law, which includes liability for harm. The EU intends to bring in legislation next year on due diligence, which will be mandatory. Even under these new arrangements, will a company profiting from a supply chain involving forced labour have broken any laws in this country? What law would a company actually be breaking if they profit from what he called the barbaric forced labour in Xinjiang? If the UK really does intend to set an example and to lead the way, he will have to do more than tinker around the edges. One of the best things that he could do for those British businesses he rightly praised is to make the playing field level for the many British companies who do the right thing. Now, we warmly welcome the Foreign Secretary's proposed review of export controls. And if the government is successfully able to determine whether any goods exported from the UK are contributing to violations of international law in Xinjiang, that will be a breakthrough, not just in taking robust action against China's human rights abuses, but as a model that can be used in other countries around the world where British exports risk being misused. So we will pay close attention. He will also know that the House of Lords recently came together to pass two cross-party amendments which put human rights considerations at the centre of our trade policy. And I was, frankly, astonished not to hear any reference to them today. Does the government intend to get behind these efforts to ensure that our trade policy defends, not undermines, human rights? And I can tell him that I will be writing to MPs when the trade bill returns to this place to urge them to vote with their consciences. I hope the government will not find itself stranded on the wrong side of history. Mr Speaker, we cannot allow this moment to pass us by. The Foreign Secretary was right to say that this is truly horrific and the House is united in condemnation of what is happening in Xinjiang and members of all parties want Britain to act as a moral force in the world. Despite today's disappointing statement, I believe he is sincere when he says that he wants the same, but now he has to make good on his promise to back up words with real actions. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, well, can I at least thank her for what she said about uh, the approach we're taking on export controls? Um, she's wrong on a number of fronts, though, Mr. Speaker. We certainly did not brief the papers. Um, we've said that we would keep Magnitsky sanctions under review. We continue to do so. Uh, only one other country has applied Magnitsky sanctions in relation to China, and, and specifically Xinjiang, and that's uh, the US. We're taking targeted sanctions, both in the fines that we will be uh, legislating for under the MSA, uh, but also in relation to the stronger export controls. So it's not accurate what she said in that regard. And all of the measures that we announced today, the four, are new. Uh, I was a little surprised. I was a little surprised to hear refer to the EU, both in terms of uh, the new investment uh, deal that they have done with China, but also. Um, the suggestion that they have adopted stronger measures is just simply factually not correct. She referred to the amendments to the Trade Bill. I, I would, um, Mr Speaker, like to address that. I think, uh, in particular, the, the Noble Lord Lord uh, Alton's uh, amendment has attracted a lot of interest. And I think it's well-meaning, but I think it would actually be rather ineffective and counterproductive. Let me explain briefly why. It would be, frankly, absurd for any government to wait for the human rights situation in a country to reach the level of genocide, which is the most egregious uh, uh, international crime, before halting FTA negotiations. Any responsible government would have acted well before, well before then. Um, at the same time, every campaigner against free trade would seek to use uh, that uh, legal uh, provision to delay or halt FTA negotiations by tying the government up in litigation that may last months, if not years, with no plausible genocide uh, concluded at the end. And finally, while I think it's right, Mr Speaker, that the courts determine whether the very specific and, frankly, technical legal definition of genocide is met in any given situation, I think it would be quite wrong for a government or for honourable members of this House to subcontract to the courts our responsibility responsibility for deciding when a country's human rights record is sufficiently bad that we won't engage in trade negotiations. Parliament's responsibility is to determine when sanctions take place or indeed with whom we negotiate. The measures we've announced today will make sure both business and government can cater for the very real risk that supply chains are either coming to or um, to the UK or going into the internment camps of Xinjiang are not affected and UK businesses are not affected. She should unequivocally support those measures. Tom Tugendhat. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I welcome the statement by my right honourable friend today. There are some important actions that Her Majesty's Government has taken of late, and indeed supporting the ASPE inquiry into Xinjiang was a very worthwhile action by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. And I'm very glad that some of the recommendations that he's spoken about today are some of the things that we saw in the report published by the China Research Group only a few weeks ago. There are, however, other areas he could go. And I'm here particularly conscious not just about the shaping of the economic environment that we're seeing coming out of Xinjiang and the nature of slave goods getting into the UK manufacturing chain, but also in the distortion of academic ideas and academic freedoms that we are seeing here in the UK. We have a centre in Jesus College, Cambridge, which is refusing to talk about these abuses of Uyghur Muslims for fear of causing offence. Is this the first time that Jesus himself has taken 30 pieces of silver? This is a deeply disappointing moment for all of us who believe in academic freedom in the UK. And it's another example of why the UK and the Foreign Office needs to be clear in demonstrating that dirty goods are one thing, but dirty money is also unacceptable. Can I thank uh, my honourable can I thank my honourable friend uh, and pay tribute to the work that he has done, both in the Select Committee but also uh, in the, uh, the parliamentary grouping that he referred to and indeed the report that they published. Can I thank him for support, his support for these measures? They are important. They are very targeted to make sure, and this is often the case with international organised crime or indeed war crimes, that you follow the money and you prevent the ability to profit from uh, or, or to profit to uh, at financially support the kind of actions that we all want to clamp down on. Um, he uh, raised the issue of academic freedoms. We are taking further measures in that regard, and uh, there will be further legislative uh, measures that will be taken when the relevant legislative vehicles uh, are brought forth. I think he's absolutely right to raise this issue. 
Uh, he talked about Jesus College. I did my LLM at Jesus College, Cambridge. Um, and I think there is a very real risk, not just the kind of academic coercion in places where we need to protect the heartbeat, the life and soul of freedom of expression and debate, and also a risk to um, research uh, that takes place that in advance of it becoming IP. In all of those areas, both uh, in the non-legislative but also in the legislative measures, that is something that we are actively looking at. I send up to Scotland with SNP spokesperson Alan Smith. Alan Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd also thank the Foreign Secretary for uh, advance sight of the statement, uh, and indeed I'd thank him for it. These are measures that we've called for and colleagues across the House have for a number of months, so I'm glad to see some progress today. And where I would like to see more, as, as, as is usual, I don't doubt that the reaction from Beijing on this has been ferocious and will be ferocious. I think it's important for me to put on record our support for the objectives that the Foreign Secretary is setting out today. I don't believe in pretending difference exists where it doesn't, and I do believe and working together where we agree. So in that spirit, I've got a couple of constructive suggestions. I, again, Magnitsky sanctions, I, I, I note with interest his reassurance that uh, the government didn't brief the press. Well, somebody did. There was an expectation that there was going to be a more concrete announcement today on that than we've seen. And I'd reiterate my view, which I know the Foreign Secretary shares, that Magnitsky sanctions do allow us a very targeted response against individuals who are directing the sorts of activities we don't want to see. I'd warmly echo the, the comments from the Chair of the Select Committee on Confucius Institutes. Uh, these are organisations that are directly much closer within the control of the UK government and I think uh, merit a lot more scrutiny than they've been getting. Uh, on his statement today on, on the supply chain, he says that uh, the scrutiny will go up to the gates of labour camps. I, I'd applaud that, I'd warmly welcome that. But that will be a challenge in terms of getting the due diligence right, because there's a lot of opacity within the supply chains here. And I'd, uh, I have not seen the, uh, the, the detail of the package yet, but uh, look forward to an assurance from him that it will indeed go right up to the gates uh, of the, the camps. The Home Secretary is yet to lodge the legislation setting out what the fines for malfeasance are going to be. Uh, a reassurance from him today that those fines will be sufficient to focus corporate minds and not just another sunk cost would be very welcome. I think uh, we do agree on that, but I think uh, a reassurance would be useful. Uh, on the procurement points, uh, we've discussed previously with Minister Adams about uh, how warmly we welcome the extension of the procurement rules to uh, government departments. Uh, very warmly welcome that. And on the exclusion of companies from government procurement contracts, uh, could, could he reassure us that that'll extend to groups of companies because many of the companies involved in dubious activities will be trading subsidiaries. So an assurance that this will apply to groups of companies and there will be a more robust uh, approach to this than a strictly legal one uh, would be welcomed. And on the fourth part of his statement on the audit of uh, export uh, regime controls to Xinjiang, Perhaps it's just a point of, uh, of drafting in, in the statement, but uh, can you assure us that that audit will extend to goods that might end up in Xinjiang, not just going directly to it? Because, again, the opacity of the supply chains the, and the risks... The, the, the Honourable Member has got two minutes. He's now almost on three minutes. Is he about to finish? Mr Speaker, I had a couple of points. Uh, that's uh, me my, on my final point, and uh, look forward to the answers. Forgive me. Sorry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On his last point, we will make sure that the audit trail includes direct and indirect um, elements of the supply chain. Can I, can I thank him for his support for these measures and, uh, frankly, thank him for his full-throated and undiluted support uh, for these measures? On Magnitsky, we will keep that in reserve. Of course, the advantage of the measures we are taking is that they will target, in a forensic way, either those profiting from uh, forced labour or those who would financially support it, whether deliberately or otherwise. I take his points on academic freedom. I have already raised them in relation to the chair of the Select Committee. On the, uh, the, the due diligence of the audit trail for businesses, there will be a ministerially led uh, series of engagement with business, both to advise and warn them of the risk to their supply chains of doing business or uh, uh, touching on business links with Xinjiang. Um, the, he asked about the level of fines, and of course I, I will leave that to the Home Secretary, but of course they will need to be struck at the level at which they can deter those who willingly flout the transparency requirements. 
And finally, on government procurement, uh, actually the measures we've announced will uh, apply um, in England, and I would hope that the Scottish Government and the other DAs with whom we will collaborate very closely with will be able to follow suit. But of course, uh, he will understand we want to respect their competences, but I think that's something we could usefully work together on. Sir Ian Duncan Smith. Mr Speaker, can I start by welcoming my right on front statement? Uh, in the effect of the things that he's announced today being called for by the Interparliamentary Alliance for China and also the Centre for Social Justice on Modern Day Slavery. So I welcome those. And cracking down on businesses and their supply chains uh, is vitally important. <clears throat> However, um, in this week of the Holocaust Memorial, surely Magnitsky sanctions should have been in this list. I happen to believe that my right honourable friend uh, wants this to happen. So I wonder who it is in government that is blocking this uh, he can perhaps whisper it in this chamber to me. Uh, I promise him I won't tell anybody else outside. Uh, but the reality is we need those now because the evidence is clear. And the second area I just want to say to my honourable friend uh, that genocide really is a vital issue for us and I do think that he now needs to sit down and discuss with myself and others bringing forward a better amendment to make sure that we can start that process. In this week of the Holocaust Memorial, we need to act. After all, when they last didn't act, just look what happened. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank my right honourable friend, pay tribute to the work that the IPA, the CSJ has done and his leadership on this subject. Um, thank him also for, again, full-throatedly welcoming the, uh, the measures we've taken. They're quite technical, they're quite forensic, but they are targeting, as I said, uh, either those who profit from or help finance uh, this gruesome trade in the internment camps. Uh, I made the point already, he will have heard it, that on Magnitsky sanctions we keep it under review. It's evidence-led. We work with our allies on this. He'll know only in relation to um, Xinjiang, only the, the, the US have so far uh, um, uh, brought in Magnitsky sanctions, but that is something that we have certainly not ruled out. I think actually these measures today are more targeted and forensic in addressing the finance going into or profiting and coming out of um, the labour camps. I'm very happy to talk to him about uh, the issue of genocide. Uh, he will know that my father fled uh, the Holocaust. Uh, I couldn't take it more seriously. I hope he will also listen to what I said to the Honourable Lady about uh, and he will know and be all too aware of the risks of subcontracting issues to the courts, which are rightly the responsibility and the prerogative of this House, uh, and, 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 and also the fact that, frankly, we should be taking action far be uh, well below the level of a genocide in terms of the executive decisions we make. I send up to Abingdon with Leila Moran. Leila Moran. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Foreign Secretary for his statement, and I do believe he cares about these issues, as we all do. I'm very pleased to hear him say that more must be done. And he also said, internment camps, arbitrary detention, political re-education, forced labour, torture, forced sterilisation, all on an industrial scale. Horrific and barbaric, yes, but there is another word, and it is genocide. And given China's blocking of routes to pursue genocide amendments through international courts, doesn't the UK have a responsibility in line with its obligations under the Genocide Convention to find alternative routes to make the legal determination? And could you also clarify the government's position, which was previously that the determination of genocide is a matter for judges and not politicians. He did seem to contradict that a little today. And can I also echo what has already been said about coming up with an amendment that can get cross-party support. This House clearly wants to discuss this and do something about this. We must act and not stand by. Can I thank uh, the Honourable Lady, thank her, I think, for her support for the measures we're announcing today. Um, it, she's right to point to the need for a court to determine the very specific and, frankly, very exacting definition of genocide. Um, when I was a war crimes lawyer, I think at the time it's probably still true today, that that determination has only been made in relation to uh, Bosnia, uh, Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge um, uh, uh, and Rwanda. Uh, it is very exacting and a lot of, a lot of lawyers, international lawyers, have criticised it for that reason. There is a big difference between saying it is for the courts to determine uh, that specific requirement under international law uh, and saying that it is for the courts to decide when and how uh, this House and this government engages in free trade negotiations. Frankly, the bar will be well below the level of genocide and it's unthinkable that this government would engage in free trade negotiations with any country that uh, came close to that kind of uh, level of human rights abuse. 
I, I welcome the Foreign Secretary's statement today and the four new measures that focuses on business requirements and supply chains to Xinjiang, something that the Base Select Committee has been looking at. Although, Mr Speaker, I found the rest of the statement quite chilling. On the one hand, my right honourable friend talks about the high level of the vilest of all crimes being committed. In particular, my right honourable friend mentioned birth control and forced sterilisation, which are markers of genocide. So I am confused why the Foreign Secretary can't just call this crime what it is and ensure that Britain is not complicit to genocide. The Foreign Secretary has talked about judges and we know that the UN is a busted flush when it comes to investigating genocide when it comes to China. So even though the amendment in the other house when it returns here isn't perfect because it asks judges to get involved, the Foreign Secretary has an opportunity to sit with colleagues and come up with a better amendment that focuses on judges, not on trade, but on investigating genocide and bringing that decision back to the House. There is no excuse, Mr Speaker, to allow these atrocities to continue. Uh, can I thank the Honourable Lady? And uh, I know she takes a close interest in these matters and uh, pay tribute to the work of the Bayes Select Committee. Um, in relation to the genocide definition, of course, it is not just uh, evidence that uh, 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 persecution has been taken to destroy a group, it is evidence that it has been taken with the intention to destroy a group as such. It is very rarely been found because that, uh, in, in international forum because that definition is so high. Um, I think that she's right to She's right to acknowledge. She's right to acknowledge that the amendment that she referred to is, I think, in her words, imperfect. Actually, I think, in some respects, it could be counterproductive. The number one thing, the, the number one thing, to advance this debate in a sensible, uh, uh, targeted, and uh, way that would attract international support, will be to secure the UN Human Rights Commissioner or another authoritative third body to be able to go in and review and verify authoritatively what is going on in Xinjiang. I raised that with the United Nations Secretary General yesterday. Mr Speaker, can I thank the Secretary of State for his clear determination to address the human rights abuses in China? Despite having had much less media attention lately, Tibetan uh, Buddhists have uh, faced similar persecution to the Uyghurs at the hands of the Chinese government. Over half a million labourers detained in camps in the first seven months of 2020 alone. It is suspected that, uh, that the Uyghur labour, the labour of Tibetan detainees, is also in the supply chains of businesses that are household names in the United Kingdom. So can I ask the Secretary of State outline what he is doing to address the issue of forced labour from other areas under Chinese Communist Party control. Thank you. Can I thank my honourable, uh, the, honour, the honourable gentleman, um, who is also a friend, uh, for, uh, for consistently raising these issues uh, in a very targeted way. Uh, we are deeply concerned about the situation on human rights in Tibet, including restrictions on freedom of religion, freedom of religious belief, freedom of assembly, but also the reports of forced labour. Of course, the evidence is, I, I don't think, quite as uh, well documented as it is in relation to Xinjiang, but we will, of course, uh, keep those measures under review. And indeed, in the uh, Modern Slavery Act transparency requirements, they will apply across the board, not just in relation to Xinjiang. Let's I get with Crispin Blunt. Crispin Blunt. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure I was listening to the same statement as the Shadow Foreign Secretary. Uh, I thought that as a statement about our values, it was extremely clear. And uh, will my right honourable friend confirm that it's plainly morally unacceptable for British firms to profit from uh, forced labour? Uh, that, uh, and we should also bear in mind that there are a million people now uh, extrajudicially interned uh, in Xinjiang. And will he also confirm the implications of what he said about torture? Torture is a crime of universal jurisdiction and perhaps he could tell us what the implications are for Chinese officials now engaged in that. Can I thank uh, my honourable friend, um, thank him for his support for the measures we're taking. Um, I think he's right about them. Uh, can I also share his concerns, both in relation to Xinjiang and also specifically torture? Torture is an international crime, uh, and anyone uh, who uh, engages in it, directs it, uh, or takes an order even in relation to it, would be guilty 
uh, under international law. Uh, of course, the real challenge, as we know with China, is how to get remedy, how to get redress for those actions. The measures that we have announced today will prevent any profiting from forced labour or indeed uh, torture. Um, and also prevent any UK businesses financially, whether inadvertent or otherwise, supporting it. If we want to have more significant accountability, the answer is to get an authoritative third-party body to be able to review them. Uh, as we, with the greatest respect to my right honourable friend, we've managed to secure in relation to the WHO access uh, into China this week. We've got to keep pressing with our international partners, and that's why the group of, of, of international partners that are assembled is very important. It must be as broad as possible uh, in order to secure access for the UN Human Rights Commissioner. Said to Wales with Chris Bryant. Chris Bryant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, I warmly welcome these measures, but they simply aren't sufficient for the moment in hand. Um, you've only got to listen to the minister's own comments to, and read them against the Genocide Convention to see that there is a clear example of genocide being practiced in Xinjiang now, killing people, causing bodily or mental harm, uh, preventing births, uh, forcibly transferring children. These are all the markers of genocide. And of course, we need to come to a view both in this house and in the courts. But the difficulty about doing so through the courts is that China has a veto. So how are we going to make sure that we, and, that we name this as it properly is and that the people who are accountable for it actually come to justice? And can I just finally say, I've lauded him many, many times for introducing the Magnitsky um, measures. There's no point in having them and just constantly reviewing them if you never blasted well use them. Well, can I thank my, uh, the Honourable Gentleman? We have used the Magnitsky sanctions. We announced a recent uh, additional tranche of measures uh, in addition to the first. Uh, and indeed, as he will know, we're working uh, on uh, proposals to extend the model to corruption. So we've been uh, extremely assiduous in this area. I, wasn't, I, I understood his point. He, his point was how do we actually hold people individually to account for, for these crimes. And whether it's genocide or gross human rights violations, actually, the, the label uh, is less important than accountability for what are, no doubt, egregious crimes. But the reality is he's not suggested anything to me that would precipitate that. Uh, so what we're doing is taking the targeted measures uh, which will cut the funding, uh, inadvertently or otherwise, into the internment camps, prevent those in the internment camps who are running them profiting from it. Uh, of course, if we want any wider initiative, we will need a, a, a far a wider uh, range of international support, and we will need to get authoritative third parties to have some kind of access, which is why I referred to the work of the United Nations Human Rights Commission, as difficult, as challenging as it is, and why I raised it with Antonio Guterres yesterday. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, my, my right honourable friend has made a very well measured and balanced statement today. Of course, we seek a constructive relationship with China, but it has to be within the rules based system. And as he has so eloquently made clear, global Britain is values driven, or it is nothing. Can I, can I add to those who have urged him? to keep on the table continuously the Magnitsky, uh, the Magnitsky provisions, which he and I and others worked so hard to get through the House, um, and uh, to ensure that those provisions are consistently kept under review. And on, on the subject of Jesus College, of which I am also an alumnus, can I just make clear that there are two China centres. My honourable friend, the Chairman of the Select Committee, was referring to the one run by Peter Nolan. Can I thank my right honourable friend uh, for his uh, knowledge uh, and also for his commitment on this? He's absolutely right in what he said. Thank you. Uh, can I thank him for uh, uh, his uh, support? He's, I think he's right to say that we need a balanced approach. China is here to stay, has an asymmetrical economic uh, influence. There are, there are positives in the relationship as well as uh, the negatives. Uh, in particular, they've taken steps on climate change, which is very important, biggest net emitter, but also biggest uh, investor in renewables. Um, we want to try and have a constructive relationship. W what I've set out today, what this government believes in, what this Prime Minister believes in, is we will not duck when the issue of our security uh, is at stake and we will not duck when our values are at stake. And he's absolutely right. Of course, we will not take 
uh, the Magnitsky sanctions uh, lever off the table. Of course, it's evidence-driven in relation to the particular individuals. That has to be collated very carefully. Only, only one country has so far uh, instituted uh, sanctions, but, but I can assure him that it is not off the table. We now add up to East Bradford with Imran Hussein. Imran Hussein. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The persecution, genocide, and horrific human rights abuses faced by Uyghur Muslims at the hands of the Chinese government is an issue I and many others across the House have been raising for a considerable period. So, of course, it's, a wel it's welcome that the government are finally taking some action. However, this action still does not go far enough, as pointed out by a number of honourable members. Even, Mr. Speaker, even those Uyghur that have managed to flee China as refugees are still being forcibly returned. So will the UK go further and call for a full independent UN investigation and push regional countries to grant protection to Uyghur refugees? Can I thank the Honourable Gentleman, and I, he palpably and sincerely uh, is committed, as I am, to trying to do what we can to have accountability and deter the appalling uh, uh, violations of human rights. Um, we've set out the measures which I think will be important in the way I've described, in terms of the finance and the profiting from it. In relation to an independent investigation, of course, the challenge, as my right honourable friend has said, is getting access uh, to uh, the relevant parts of Xinjiang, which is why I believe, and I hope he will support, one of the things that we ought to do is be a gathering as wide a group of like-minded countries to press for the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner to be able to have access. That would have the dual benefit of, first of all, substantiating uh, the widespread reports uh, of the violations of human rights I've described, but also give China its opportunity to rebut and to, uh, to reject uh, those claims based on the evidence that it and, uh, it and only it has and can control. Let's head up to Wickham with Steve Baker. Steve Baker. Mr Speaker, I welcome this statement and the exceptional strength of the terms in which it was made by my right honourable friend. As somebody who represents thousands of British Muslims, I can tell him that this is an issue of the most acute concern right here in Wickham. I listened to how he answered the front, Labour front bench and also our honourable friend for Wealdon. Could I just say to him that the government's going to need to be extremely careful to make sure that it demonstrates to British Muslims that we are in fact taking leadership in this matter by any international standard. And I would just ask him to make sure that he does at all times maintain our leadership. Richard? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank my honourable friend? He's absolutely right, and uh, there will be widespread concern amongst Mis Muslim communities right across the country about this. Uh, what I can reassure him is that uh, we have uh, led in the UN, third uh, UN General Assembly Third Committee, we've led in the United Nations Human Rights uh, Council, and we've led the way very much with the package of measures that I've announced today. Um, we will continue to work with our international partners, including uh, Muslim Arab countries, those of the region, as well as the uh, traditional and predictable Five Eyes European partners, uh, to try and expand the caucus of like-minded states that will stand up to be counted on these issues. And I believe that we are the ones setting an example, and we are the ones, in his words, leading the way. Let's head to Leighton with John Cryer. John Cryer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as others have, have said repeatedly, this is genocide, very clearly genocide. The parallels with the 1930s are equally clear, and the Foreign Secretary knows that at least as well as, as, uh, as anyone else. And the boldness of the Chinese government is demonstrated by the fact that they repeatedly claim that forced sterilization is a victory for feminism. Now, as twisted propaganda goes, that is about as bad as it gets. But could I ask him a specific question? In his discussions with the Home Secretary and others across government, could they look at the possibility of prioritising asylum applications from Uyghur Muslims and offering the, the appropriate support to those applicants? Because when they arrive in Britain, as some undoubtedly will, hopefully will, they will be vulnerable, they will be traumatised, and also they are very, very likely to have no English at all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Honourable Gentleman and uh, who share his concerns about the appalling uh, human rights violations? Um, he, he asked about uh, whether we could prioritise one category of asylum 
uh, claimants over another, I, I think that would be problematic. I have to say to him, I, I think the, the asylum system is, uh, is blind to region or political considerations. It is based on the suffering and the persecution which the individual uh, can present. And I, and I think that that is the right approach. But of course, uh, I, I do take on board the points he made about making sure that those who have suffered such awful uh, crimes when they arrive in this country get the support that they need. That said to Robbie Moore. Robbie Moore. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is clear that in Western China, more than half a million minority workers are being coerced into seasonal cotton picking. And this, of course, is in addition to a large scale network of detention camps where over a million are reported to be forced into work in textile factories, all of which are denied by the Chinese government. So I very much welcome today's announcement and would uh, my, um, urge and would my honourable right honourable friend agree with me that these will be key mechanisms to combating for labour and modern slavery. Can I thank my honourable friend, can I welcome his support, and they will be an important tool, they're very targeted, it's forensic. What is also important is we work with our international partners because of course we're one country and if you want to deal with supply chains and prevent the kind of uh, abuse or profiting from abuse that we are all I think in this house rightly concerned about, we need to get the widest caucus of support for those measures to be as effective as possible. Patrick Grady. You'll know that the World Uyghur Congress has called for the Uyghur diaspora, such as it is, to be provided with financial, medical, psychological and legal support. So I do want to echo the calls uh, from Bradford East and Leighton about discussing with the Home Office. Even if you can't give priority, at the very least there ought to be a presumption against uh, deportation back to China of anyone seeking uh, refuge and asylum from the Uyghur community. Can I thank the Honourable Gentleman? Um, of course, uh, anyone who has a claim to asylum would not be able to be deported back. Th those are the rules, so they can apply. I think if we want to strengthen and go further, what I would welcome his support is working with uh, the Scottish Government, the DAs more generally, to make sure this is something where in lockstep the UK can send out a single, coherent, crystal clear message. I think that will be a good example of Global Britain, something which actually we should all be able to work together on. It's head to Crawley with Henry Smith. Henry Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Whether it be abuses against the Uyghur in Xinjiang, uh, people in Hong Kong, Tibet, or elsewhere, uh, will my right and moral friend agree that it is the responsibility of the United Kingdom to build a global alliance uh, to ensure uh, that we act together against a China that is going? against international norms and what is this country doing in that respect can i thank my uh, honorable friend and uh, i can point to the work we did in the human rights council the work we did in the third uh, committee of the un general assembly where we collated uh, over 30 uh, uh, countries to support our statement on human rights in both hong kong and xinjiang of course there are many countries that are very nervous in their dealings with China because of its asymmetric economic clout uh, and therefore we need to proceed uh, carefully, sensitively to make sure we carry as many people with us and as many countries with us to have the maximum effect in terms of deterring the actions that China takes and maximising our chances of protecting human rights. Let's head over to the member for Huddersfield, Barry Sherman. Barry Sherman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I welcome what the Foreign Secretary said today? Um, I think he was being strong. He could be a bit stronger on sanctions. But could I say to him, right across the piece, this is a repressive regime that hates democracy, does not care for human rights. And can we have a comment from him on that uh, rather, uh, I thought, veiled threat? from the Chinese ambassador who's recently left our shores when he, said, when he said the UK must make up its mind whether it is a, 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 a rival uh, or a partner. What, what does he think about that sort of veiled threat? Thank the Honourable Gentleman. Thank him for his support. Um, I, I don't think uh, we will uh, either take uh, diktats from any government on the way we proceed. We recognise, as I said, the scope for positive relations with China in areas, including, I mentioned the example I gave was climate change, but I was also clear we will 
absolutely protect every area of our national security and will stand up for our values. And I thought that the ambassador's performance, frankly, on the uh, Andrew Marr show, when he was shown the live footage of what is going on in Xinjiang, um, I think was all the scrutiny uh, that we need to see and promote. And actually, it was a good example uh, of the answers or the questions that are left unanswered by the government in Beijing. Fiona Bruce. Mr Deputy Speaker, I uh, thank the Foreign Secretary for his statement today. Uh, today we are deeply concerned about the plight of the Uyghurs. On another day, it is the plight of the Rohingyas, and yet on another day, the Yazidis. How can we effectively hold those responsible to account so that we can truly say and mean the words, never again? Can I thank my honourable uh, friend? Can I also pay tribute to her? Uh, and congratulate her on her recent appointment as Special Envoy on Freedom of Religious Belief. I know her, not just her knowledge, but her tenacity uh, will stand her in good stead and will be a great asset to global Britain. Um, she's right to raise all of the different groups, actually in relation to the Rohingya, that's an area where we introduce Magnitsky sanctions. Um, and I think the most important thing is to proceed, first of all, with targeted measures, as we've done today, to try and address the specific wrong that we wish to right, and to work as effectively and assiduously with all of our international partners. Because in many of these cases, shifting the dial, uh, making the relevant government listen, requires concerted international action, and that's what we're committed to. Heading up to Birmingham with Shabana Mahmood. Shabana Mahmood. Thank, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The measures announced today are welcome, and I do thank the Secretary of State for his statement, but they do not sufficiently address the genocide against the Uyghur people and other ethnic and religious minorities in Xinjiang. And I noted with deep dismay his remarks about the amendment to the trade bill, which I and many other members will wish to support. Will the Foreign Secretary at least acknowledge that efforts to allow UK judges to provide expert input and make preliminary determinations on genocide is in the absence of any other the viable legal option, the only legal route to hold the Chinese government to account and the only viable opportunity in a legal forum to call their actions by their proper name, and that is genocide. Well, can I thank the Honourable Lady and, and respect the passion and the commitment with which she speaks. Uh, of course, I, I don't think that the amendment that she refers to would hold China to account for the awful human rights violations uh, that she and I rightly deplore. Um, and what we've sought to do today is take the targeted measures, and we'll continue to do so, which will have an effect and will have an impact uh, on uh, the, the, the conduct that we want to stop by preventing people profiting from it or financially supporting it. I think that's the right approach. Uh, of course, we keep other measures in reserve, whether it's on Magnitsky sanctions, but I don't think that the, uh, the proposal that she's referring to would advance the cause of accountability in any meaningful sense at all. We now go to Suzanne Webb. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I welcome the Secretary of State's statement today. And does my right honourable friend agree with me that it is essential for the relevant international bodies to be granted unfettered access to Xinjiang to assess human rights abuses occurring? Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I entirely agree with uh, uh, my honourable friend. Uh, I think that the most important thing that could shift the dial on accountability and, frankly, have a deterrent effect would be an authoritative third party to be able to go and review and to test the denials of the Chinese government against the widespread reports that we've seen. I personally think that the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner is well placed to do that, authoritative, independent, no bias, no partisan, no political interference. China has rejected that. We need to keep the pressure up for uh, that uh, individual or someone else of a similar level of impartiality and influence and authority. We now go to Sarah Owen. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. What's happening in Xinjiang is the tragic reality of state-sanctioned Islamophobia. Leaders within the Muslim community in Luton North have expressed to me their horror at seeing this government stand idly by while these human rights abuses are carried out, including reports of forced sterilisation of Uyghur women, which is expressly forbidden under Article 2D on the UN Convention on Genocide. I've asked before, I'll ask again. Will the UK government now use, not just talk about, sanctions to address these gross human rights abuses imposed on the Uyghur people? 
Can I thank the Honourable Lady? I, she may have missed what I've said, but the, through the transparency requirements, the fines, the export controls, the four measures I announced today, we are uh, increasing the strength of the targeted measures that we're taking, and of course we hold Magnitsky sanctions, as other Honourable Members have asked in reserve. We now go to Christian Wakeford. Mr. Speaker, um, the appalling and abhorrent persecution of the Uyghur in Xinjiang has rightly received sustained condemnation, not only from all sides of his house, but from around the world. But let's not mince words, and let's call it for what it is, which is genocide. As we head towards Holocaust Memorial Day, which this year's theme is to be the light in the darkness, let us, as the UK, be that light in the darkness and take a firm stance against these crimes. With that in mind, will my right and rule friend outline what practical steps he is taking to, to coordinate international responses, providing hard-hitting sanctions against the Chinese government and all those guilty of these heinous crimes? Before I call the Foreign Secretary, um, it's really important that we ha have um, short questions because I'm going to have to cut the speaking list uh, down because we've got another statement and then a very well-subscribed debate. Foreign Secretary. I thank my honourable friend. I think we have showed precisely the interna international leadership that he's shown. The reality is we uh, gained, I think it was 35 plus uh, countries supporting our statement in the United Nations General Assembly Third Committee, but there are a lot of countries around the world who either uh, do not wish to take the measures that he described are nervous, understandably, perhaps given their proximity or their economic size, about the reprisals that China would take, and therefore we do need to proceed uh, carefully and sensitively with our international partners. Uh, and, and on that point, he's absolutely right. Now go to Asfal Khan. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Whilst I welcome the Foreign Secretary's announcement today on forced vegan labour, like a number of other honourable members, I feel that it has failed to address the sus suspected genocide against the Uyghur Muslims. A recent tweet by the CCP brazenly branded forced sterilization of Uyghur women as emancipation. The UN Convention on Genocide clearly forbids such measures. So what steps, therefore, is the Foreign Secretary taking to support the appointment of UN Special Rapporteur for the investigation of forced labor and ethnic persecution of in Xinjiang. Can I thank the honourable gentleman? He raised a really interesting point, and I know he's raised it before. Um, the challenge is that we know that China would block uh, efforts to appoint the special rapporteur or, or envoy. And I think that he and I would agree that we don't want to give that, uh, if you like, PR coup uh, or failed initiative uh, to, to, to our detractors. The, the one thing I think we can and should do, as I've said several times before the House today, is focus on getting the UN Human Rights Commissioner some kind of access to Xinjiang. That will keep it on the agenda. I don't think anyone can accuse the UN Human Rights Commissioner of being anything other than objective, impartial, and I think that that is something that other countries ought to be able to rally to, and that's where we focused our efforts. Now go to Dr Jamie Wallace. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Foreign Secretary for his statement today, and I welcome the measures that he's outlined. Uh, but would my right honourable friend agree with me that if China is to be considered a leading member of the international community, it must abide by basic international rules and norms? He's absolutely right. He's right as a matter of human rights, but he's also right as a matter of trust. One of the issues both on this but also in relation to the joint declaration and in, relation, in the context of Hong Kong, as we said, is that these are obligations freely assumed. These are basic obligations that come with being a responsible member, as, as he says, a leading member of the international community. And ultimately, if China cannot live up to those responsibilities and, in, and obligations, it raises a much broader issue of trust and confidence in it. We now go to John Nicholson. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. The poet Perhat Tursun, one of the foremost living writers in the Uyghur language, is just one of around a million who have been disappeared by the Chinese state into the so-called re-education camps. Tursun has been missing since his detention in January 2018. In one of his poems, he writes presently, when they search the streets and cannot find my vanished figure, do you know that I am with you? Mr. Speaker, 
the Foreign Secretary must go further than today's announcements. Uyghurs aren't being persecuted for what they pick, but for who they are. As with the Tibetans, does he support their right to the self-determination that they seek? Can I thank the Honourable Gentleman? We certainly want to see the human rights, the freedoms, the basic liberties uh, of the people of Tibet, uh, the people of Hong Kong and the people of Xinjiang respected. We're taking a series of measures. We're at the vanguard internationally in the measures that we've taken. It is important to try and keep uh, clusters of like-minded partners with us to have the maximum effect to precisely to provide redress and accountability for the violations of human rights that he and I rightly deplore. We now go to Deanna Davison. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Foreign Secretary for his statement and welcome the strong stance we're taking against the atrocious human rights violations we're seeing evidence of. Now, I've had a number of Bishop Auckland constituents ask how we in the UK can play our part in tackling this. So, on this note, does my right honourable friend agree with me that it's incumbent on businesses to ensure that nothing they're doing is contributing to making the situation in Xinjiang worse? Can I thank my honourable friend? I absolutely agree with the spirit, but also the practical uh, advice that, uh, and warning that she's giving. What we're trying to do is set out clear guidance for businesses, which she's referred to, to make sure that they're warned uh, of the risks, because, of course, conducting a due diligence about the supply chains emanating from Xinjiang is quite tricky to do. We want to work with them. That's why ministers will be engaging with businesses. And ultimately, they need to comply with their obligations, their transparency obligations, so that everyone can see the due diligence they've conducted. If they do that, they have nothing to fear. If they don't, we'll find them. Number 27 withdrawn, so we go to Dr Andrew Morrison. The government is to be congratulated for the leadership internationally that it's applied in this matter. To what extent does the Foreign Secretary think uh, that the bribes, inducements and threats under the Belt and Road Initiative are muting international condemnation from countries in Africa, the Middle East and continental Europe that would otherwise be expected to join the UK wholeheartedly in condemning the depredations of President Xi and his people. Can I thank uh, uh, my honourable friend, and he will know, and I pay tribute to his time at the Foreign Office, where he was an exceptional minister, the challenges that we face. Um, he asks about Belt and Road. The truth is China is a massive investor all over the world, and you can see with the EU investment agreement right the way through to what the Ch Chinese government is doing in Africa, that there's a huge amount of money at stake. China has asymmetric economic size and clout, and of course uh, countries are, uh, 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 are bearing that in mind, taking that into account. What we've got to do is make sure there's a compelling, plausible, credible alternative, both in relation to those investments, and to also make sure everyone understands the shared value, the shared stake we have in upholding the rules-based international system, of which human rights are a key component. We now go to Florence Eshalomi. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Vauxhall residents have contacted me appalled at the widespread forced labour of the Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang province. We must do everything in our power to stop the Chinese government abusing its own people and to ensure that those responsible are held to account. I welcome the measures outlined by the Foreign Secretary to outline what additional help we can do to get our own house in order when it comes to doing business with Xinjiang. But the world must be united in its message to China. So can the Secretary of State confirm what further actions we are taking with our allies across the world to take a shared robust response to these appalling abuses? Can I thank the Honourable Lady? Can I share the outrage of her constituents? Can I thank her for her support? We've laid out a suite of measures. I've explained what we're doing in the Human Rights uh, Council, the, the, the General Assembly Third Committee. We keep working with our international partners, but as um, she will have noted, uh, we are, whilst we're leading the way, there are a lot of countries who are nervous of speaking out, partly because of the economic clout that China has. Um, and uh, we have certainly been having conversations with many countries, including countries with the larger Muslim populations than our own, about why they are not more outspoken on this issue. Uh, one of the things that I think would help, given
given China's blanket denial, is to get in to Xinjiang, the UN Human Rights Commissioner. So there can be no doubt, no quibbling, uh, no question that, um, that these uh, violations are taking place. And I think it will help uh, raise the kind of coalition of like-minded that she talks about to have an authoritative, independent uh, party like the UN Human Rights Commissioner conduct that kind of review. I go to Raymond Chisty. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I very much welcome the statement by the Foreign Secretary in dealing with the horrific uh, situation in Xinjiang. Um, with regards to the United Kingdom's leadership on the matter and further actions it can take, the United Kingdom will be hosting the G7 later this year, and the United Kingdom will be uh, hosting the presidency of the Security Council uh, next month in February. Will this issue and the wider topic of freedom of religion or belief be put on the agenda on both uh, conferences and events to show the United Kingdom's strong leadership to take firm, decisive action. Can I thank my um, honourable friend and uh, pay tribute to his work as Special Envoy on freedom of religious belief. Uh, I can assure him, uh, without divulging too much in advance of the, uh, of the agenda, uh, that human rights will be uh, at the forefront of our leadership uh, this year, both in terms of the presidency of the UN Security Council, our, our G7 presidency, and more generally, because we believe that the UK has a crucial role to play in promoting open societies, including on human rights, but also defending public goods in areas like climate change and COVID response. We now go to Kim Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I've been horrified, like others, by the report of human rights abuses in Xinjiang, including mass detentions, forced sterilizations, and efforts to restrict cultural and religious practices and mass surveillance, disproportionately targeting the Uyghur um, population. What steps is Secretary of State taking to support the appointment of a UN Special Rapporteur for the investigation of forced labour and ethnic persecution in Xinjiang? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, look, we would uh, certainly welcome such a special envoy, but as I said in an earlier uh, answer to a previous question, the reality is that China will block it um, if such, if we uh, formally propose that, which is why, uh, as I've said, I think repeatedly, what really matters is an authoritative, independent, non-partisan uh, individual or body can have access to Xinjiang, and the UN Human Rights Commissioner would seem to me one, there are others, but one uh, uh, such uh, individual that could perform that role, which is why we've raised it with our international partners, why I've raised it with the UN Secretary General. We now go to Tim Lawton. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, last week, the Chinese Embassy in Washington proudly proclaimed that their employment policies in Xinjiang promoted gender equality for Uyghur women. So now we know that the Chinese government is an equal opportunities slave labor employer. So I strongly welcome these uh, measures, but will you go further, not just in calling out this persecution at the UN as genocide and invoking the Majewski sanctions as colleagues have suggested, but follow the example of Congress in passing a reciprocal access bill, as I have on the order paper with my Tibet reciprocal access bill to prohibit Chinese officials traveling to the UK if UK and Western human rights inspectors are denied access to factories and prisons in Xinjiang and Tibet, for example, to verify these new measures he's announced today. Can I thank my honourable friend uh, and thank him for his support for the measures that we've taken. I understand that he wants us to go even further. He knows he's an expert in this area, uh, the challenges in uh, cajoling and carrying an international uh, coalition to advance those goals. I think he's right to say that uh, scrutiny and accountability is absolutely key. That's why we uh, want to see authoritative third party like the UN Human Rights Commissioner have access to Xinjiang. I will uh, await with great interest, and I'm sure Parliament will scrutinise very carefully uh, his bill when it comes before the House. Uh, before I call Alistair Carmichael, um, I'm afraid this will be the last question because we did have an hour allocated and we will have been an hour and ten minutes by the time we finish this one. So the last question is from Alistair Carmichael, and I think it is audio only. Alistair Carmichael. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, frustrating though it is for many of us, I do understand the Foreign Secretary's reluctance to engage in the question of genocide, but he will know from his own professional background that the government has a duty to assess the risk factors of genocide against the Uyghurs in China in order to trigger its duty to prevent. 
All this came from the ICJ judgment in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina against Serbia and Montenegro. So he will also know that that obligation crystallizes at the moment that a state learns or should have learned of the serious risk of genocide. So can the Foreign Secretary confirm that his department is making that assessment of the risk factors of genocide? And will he then publish its conclusions? Well, can I thank the right honourable gentleman? And I think he uh, makes a, uh, an interesting and insightful uh, comment on the issue of genocide. Um, and of course, I was in The Hague when the Bosnia judgment was uh, being uh, considered. Uh, the reality is, in order to secure authoritative um, uh, assessment and conclusions in relation to the widespread reports that we think are tenable, plausible, uh, and credible, we would need to have access to the camps. So we are, in a sense, throughout this uh, oral statement today, redefining the question. We come back to the point that we need to try and uh, secure access to Xinjiang. Uh, we won't be able to do that without sufficient and widespread pressure on the Chinese government, and I think the best vehicle for that is an authoritative independent uh, body or individual uh, entrusted by the United Nations, which, of which China is a leading member through the Security Council, and the UN Human Rights Commission would seem to me the right place and the right uh, individual to support in that regard. I thank the Foreign Secretary for the statement, and um, in order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safe arrival of those participating in the next, I am suspending the House for three minutes.